the Vikings are still with us and have added to our culture materially, linguistically and various other ways. Join us for another episode of 100 Years, 100 Objects, Stories from Lancaster City Museums. I'm Rachel Roberts and I'm the Collections Registrar for Lancaster City Museums. In this series, we're looking at 100 objects from Lancaster, Morecambe and the surrounding area to celebrate a century of our museums and to find out more about the past and how we relate to it now. Today's object helped to keep someone presentable in the 10th century. It's both a useful tool and a beautiful object to help the owner show their style. Today's object is an early medieval comb. The comb is a similar size to modern plastic ones, 19.5 cm by 4 cm. It is made of bone or antler. Originally it would have had about 70 teeth, and amazingly all but a few have survived all these years. The comb is rectangular overall, with the teeth being set into a wide handle which is pinned together with small plugs and decorated with a simple pattern of carved lines. Combs would have been a common personal item for the people at the time, and this one was found in 1978 during excavations around St Patrick's Chapel in Hesham. We spoke to Adam Parsons, who is an early medieval find specialist and archaeological illustrator with Oxford Archaeology. As an archaeologist, we asked him to start the story of this comb with where and when it was found after so long in the ground. In the late 1970s, there were excavations on St Patrick's Chapel and the surrounding areas at Hesham, and they uncovered a number of graves, there's about 50 graves or something there, and containing even more bodies, it's like 60 to 70 bodies were found there. A lot of them were in little stone kists, but very few artefacts, which is pretty common in Christian cemeteries of the 7th through to 11th centuries. Except one of the graves, the female grave, had that comb close to her hip. It's not unusual but it's a beautiful little artefact. It's quite interesting that you know combs are something that are quite commonly put in graves with people, and they're often quite large, quite nicely decorated things too, so they're an interesting topic of study, because when people think about the early medieval past, usually their thoughts are weapons and warfare and dirty and hairy and furs and things like that. But actually, one of the most prized possessions in the period in male and female graves are combs. And they're highly decorated and it's one of the most common artefacts. The Hesham area in the 10th century and combs alike are often linked with Vikings. So we asked Adam to tell us a little bit more about what a Viking actually was and the history of the area in this period. Viking tends to get used, generally speaking, to refer to the 9th, 10th and beginning of the 11th centuries, talking about Scandinavian immigrants. But studies over the past number of years have shown that actually Viking as a sort of occupation can be taken up by a lot of people, Polish people, German people. There are laps been found in Viking graves. And so whilst it may be an occupation that's done by Scandinavians a lot of the time, actually there are a lot more cultures involved in this. And it tends to get used in modern language to refer to those periods and the weird behaviour that's going on really with people immigrating and emigrating to and from the region from all sorts of different countries. Not just Scandinavia, but Ireland and and all over the place. But actually, the vast majority of people who were Vikings in this area were probably not Vikings in their sense of the word. They were just people who'd moved here, living here, farming here, working here, craftspeople here, making things like that comb, perhaps. Generally speaking, we're sitting in a, a sort of black spot historically. We know what's going on in York throughout the 9th century. You know, there's a great army that's raiding southern and eastern Britain. It's occupying York. We know a little bit about what's going on in Ireland. And of course, we sort of sit in between York and Ireland, (laughs) but we don't really know an awful lot about who's in charge there. We know when you go a little bit further south, it's part of the Kingdom of Mercia, and that tends to creep slowly northwards in the 10th century under people like uh, Lady Athelfleet, Lady of the Mercians, who's pushing the extents of Mercia towards Chester and just a little bit north of that. We know in the western part of Scotland, modern day Scotland, that is down perhaps to northern Cumbria, there's a kingdom, Strathclyde which perhaps calls itself Cumberland later on. And that's a Brythonic kingdom, what we think of as Welsh-speaking. And that's in northern Cumbria, but of course it leaves that bit of southern Cumbria and North Lancashire as a bit of a a blank spot. So we really don't know who's in control, but there are an awful lot of hordes here that we consider to be Viking hordes of silver. 
So it seems to be a sort of middle ground where people are passing through and perhaps it's local lords that are in charge of the area and they could be Scandinavian speaking, Gaelic speaking, English speaking, Britonic speaking. So perhaps a little bit of a no man's land where people can pass their goods through and travel through, but no one's really in overall control until perhaps the 11th century. The chapel and indeed the church next to it, St Peter's, seem to be from this period. Now the chapel, it's believed, is perhaps 8th century, so that's the 700s when it's first built based on those excavations. And it's slightly smaller than the footprint you see today little bit shorter but basically the same sort of building there's a little wall around it we think and some burials in there and some sockets cut in the rock for some standing crosses perhaps with burials in them then later on we don't know how much later whether it's 50 years later or whether it's in the 9th and 10th centuries the chapel is expanded there is a little bit more graveyard and some more burials going who these people are we've got no clue but there are women there are children there as well as men of course so it is Perhaps not the sort of thing you'd expect of a monastery where you'd expect to see all men or a nunnery where you'd expect to see all women or you'd certainly expect to see adults even if it was a mixed nunnery. You've got more diverse population there and you've got St Peter's Church down the hill which is certainly there by the 10th century because there's sculpture from that period there. But quite how they interact and interface we don't know. What's interesting is none of them seem to have been destroyed or burnt down. Of course the Vikings have this reputation for destroying ecclesiastical sites. Well, not particularly those two from the evidence we have. So there's a lot more acculturation and tolerance and cooperation between all the different cultures in the Irish Sea region. So let's get back to our comb and find out a little bit more about it, from how it was made to how it was used. Combs in the early medieval period are one of the most common artefacts, and some of them are in very wealthy graves, very highly decorated. Obviously, there's two elements to this. Number one, it's a comb, it's for combing your hair, so it's about appearance and hygiene. We do find wear patterns on them, you do find lice in them, so they are being used to keep yourself clean. But your appearance is something very important too. What's interesting is the fact that they're found in very high status graves and very well decorated, which means it's something that's very important for people to be seen doing and wearing. So their appearance is very important to them. And that sort of public display of I keep my hair nice, I doesn't my hair look good, and both men and women is very important in the period. And they, they seem from where they are in the graves to be worn on belts and hanging from brooches. So there'd possibly be something you saw somebody wearing around town as well when they were out in there their Sunday best, so to speak. The material the combs are made out of is either bone or antler, but that doesn't necessarily mean, just because that's a cheap material that's a sort of byproduct of the meat industry, it doesn't mean that they were necessarily poor items. They're very well made, very highly decorated, some of them, so they're clearly high status items too. To actually construct them, you basically have to make them out of several pieces of it, because most of the bits of bone are quite large and lumpy. So what we're looking to do is make little plates, and they form part of the teeth plates. Now, I think in the Hesian comb there's about 10 of these little plates they're about an inch or 25 millimeters wide and only a millimeter or so thick so little flat plates and you place these side by side in a row so they make a rectangle and then you place two long strips of bone or antler either side and then these are held together with rivets so the two bits either side form sort of the spine in the back of the comb now these flat plates at the moment have no teeth in them but then you cut into the plates the teeth themselves that's roughly how you make a comb it's quite a complicated process and it takes in excess of 30 hours to make one and that's a simple one too. Decorated ones could be two, three times that. As archaeologists, we do find tools from the period, but often they're quite crude ones because the sort of fine saw blades and chisels that you need for this sort of work will be a millimetre wide, which means they, they rot. Or if they haven't rotted, they're almost unrecognisable. So it tends to be only the larger saws that we find. But we do obviously have words and some images showing saws, and we have objects that have been cut with saw teeth marks so we know they exist so yeah it's, it's a saw for the teeth work just like a modern hacksaw really that you could go and buy in a, a shop in town today now the hesian comb when you look at the back of it it's got like little checkerboard saw cuts on it so you just run the saw very shallow into the surface to make a groove any osseous material whether it's antler or bone or whatever goes a bit brown funky colored when it's been in the ground so First thing you have to do when thinking about the original comb is imagine its original colour, which is the colour of bone, white, a nice ivory colour. 
And not only that, the surfaces of them are highly polished. Now, whether there's any dark colour in there, that's something that's open to debate because we've found traces of wax and charcoal, beeswax and charcoal in some examples, but not necessarily on every single one. So whether they did it to all combs or whether because it's just beeswax and charcoal, perhaps after a thousand years, we've lost that. We don't really know. So it's entirely possible that they were black and white in original appearance, but they would certainly be very white and shiny. That's for certain. Does this comb mean that Vikings and other 10th century people were serious about their beauty regimens? What do we know about Viking hygiene and hairstyling? V- very little, and even less of it's made its way into the public sphere. So when we're thinking about Viking hygiene, as I've said before, we often think about hairy, dirty, smelly Vikings, you know, and and that is borne out by some sites. So we will find sites which have got parasites and things like that in the settlement deposits there. But these are often quite small buildings that may have been very low status, may even have held enslaved people and things like that. In the fancier buildings, they have bigger wooden floors, they have quite a fancy lifestyle. So I think, like a lot of things, just how good your quality of life and hygiene was, depending on how wealthy and and privileged you were. But certainly a comb forms part of all those things. We find poor combs, we find expensive combs. We do have very little hair from the early medieval people. In fact, whilst we are talking about the comb, Lancaster Museum does have a, a lovely piece of hair on display there from um, Quorma, which is pretty rare, really. I mean, you, you can count on one hand the examples of hair that we've found from the early medieval period. And even that is in a style. We've found examples from uh, low countries in Scandinavia with styles sometimes braided and plaited quite elaborately. You can see people when they're being drawn on manuscripts and runestones, they have cut hairstyles, cut moustaches, cut beards, frequently clean shaven too, which is not something people think. People always imagine beards, but you look at the bio tapestry and count how many beards that there are on there. Very few. So there are obviously different ways of wearing your hair. We have documentary sources that sort of obliquely refer to Anglo-Saxon men cutting their hairstyles in a a way that Scandinavian men were doing and it was sort of frowned upon because it was a new fashion. Now, all these sources, of course, you have to take with a pinch of salt. But what it does tell us is that hairstyle appearance was very important to people, that there were fashions and trends that people were adopting and changing, moving all the time. And of course, the frustrating thing is to archaeologists, almost invisible, except for the fact we have so many combs, it's clearly the elephant in the room, so to speak. To finish... Adam told us what happened to all the wonderfully coiffed Vikings who brushed their hair in Hesham in the 10th century. Where did they go? Or indeed, are they still with us? Well, yeah, the Vikings are still with us in the region. That's why we have local dialect words that are very heavily drawing on Scandinavian. That's why we have place names like Nesses, Furness, for example, that rely on Gaelic elements and Scandinavian elements. Um, A lot of northern dialect is that, you know, and... There have been gene studies looking at populations in the northwest, and we have a very strong Scandinavian genetic marker. The Scandinavians didn't go anywhere. They settled around here and, and formed part of that genetic makeup of people from this region, really, and have added to our culture materially, linguistically, and various other ways. There's a Viking festival at Hesham in July. You can often see people making combs at the Viking festival. It's a wonderful place to visit anyway, it's Hesham Headland, and it's a gem that not many people know about, really, particularly lovely standing archaeology there. How often can you go and see a building with a doorway you can walk through above head height that dates from the 8th, 9th century? That's crazy, really. And, of course, famously, the rock cut graves up there appear on a Black Sabbath album cover, so what's not to like about that? (laughs) Thank you for combing through history with us today. We hope you will check out some of our other episodes where we examine objects ranging from backstaffs to beaver felt hats. 